Welcome to Raging Bullets, a DC Comics fan podcast, episode 607. Welcome to Raging Bullets. I'm Sean Whalen, Dr. Norge, and I'm joined as always by my co-host Jim, the sensei of the whatnot, the Duke of you know, the Sultan of Strategery, the indestructible, bridge-defying, now being featured as the lead in the new comic I Am Batmite One Half, and the elder statesman of the podcast, Segulin. <laughs> <laughs> Jim, on this episode, we're going to be talking about Fear State Alpha number one, Hardware Season one number one, in an action packed episode. We are sponsored, as always, by DCB Service and InStockTrades.com. Jim, what is going on over at DCBService.com? Yeah, one of the things I like to do with DCBS is not just look at the comic books, because we know they get great deals on all comic books, all publishers. So Please check that out. But they've got this wide variety of perils, toys, models, collectibles, games, different card games, dice games, the, the role-playing games. You know, So there's a nice wide variety of options available on DCBS with different discounts and savings galore. So please check out what DCBS offers. And thank you, DCBS. Over at InStockTrades.com, we've got some great new releases. Batman Adventures Cat Got Your Tongue. Regularly $9.99, 42% off, only $5.79. It's a great deal on an amazing trade paperback. Batman Zero Year trade paperback. If you haven't read this, terrific story. $29.99, regularly 42% off, only $17.39. I want to thank DCB Service and InStockTrades.com for continuing to support our show. Mr. Segulin, what kind of a podcast are we? Raging Bullets is a spoiler podcast. We go in-depth into plot lines, story twists, and whatnot of the comics we're discussing on today's show. So, if you haven't read the books, you may want to come back later so you can better enjoy the show. Let's talk some comics. Come on, Screel. Let's pay these plutonian beam makers a visit. Jim, before we kick into our discussion on Fear State, one of the things I wanted to talk about is we know that the current writer is leaving, and I, I was sad about that because of the fact that I'm really enjoying this run. I always get worried about what's going to come next, who is going to be the next writer. Uh, we've been very lucky with DC in that um, writers who have come to Batman have been just really great quality writers, and they brought something new to the story. It's Joshua Williamson. Is Ooh. going to be taking over. Yeah, nice. exactly. My reaction was exactly what yours just was. Uh, I I really enjoyed, in particular, the Flash run. Um, and I'm not limiting it to that, please. I, this is a writer now from that Flash run that I love following what Joshua Williamson's doing. Yeah, kind of a great choice. <laughs> over there. So I'm excited um, because Batman is a book where... As we go in to talk about Fear State, I love long-form storytelling with Batman, where there's a build to, like, big events and big stories, and uh, I don't get eventitis with this kind of thing. I don't want them constantly. I actually love the build. You know, so, I mean, this Fear State, I think one of the things that's going to be fun to talk about is th there's been a great build to this, and this is built off of storylines that have come before. really makes you feel like this is an ongoing universe, you talked in the past on the show about how much you enjoy progression. This is the kind of progression I like, where there's a feeling that, why does continuity matter? It's because previous stories that have occurred build and feed and inform and are setups in ways that you never realized. I love that the whole Joker story that, that came in the past was a huge build to this. Fear State could not be happening if it wasn't for what happened in the Joker War story. This is, I love this. I love the build. Um, where, like, as you were walking into Fear State, where were you at, like, on the Bat Books? And is, is this a storyline that you were anticipating? Oh, God, yeah. This was, you know, uh, you, know you think back to just, <laughs> you know, um, you, it was funny, you hit it on the, head, the nail on the head there with the progression. You know, one of the things that I dig with the Bat Books is they're not throwing anything away. Everything is building, and it's the different stories and the different titles are feeding into each of the books. 
you know, future, look at future state, which everyone thought was, oh, just a throwaway. No, it's actually, we are now seeing future state happening. And I love, that's something I've been really loving about the Bat books and all of the different books associated with the Bat logo. You know, you, we saw that final future state. We are now seeing where it could go to that. You know, it may still go to that. The future Bat titles after Fear State may be future state, and then we have the post-future state. So we don't really know what's going to happen. I love the fact that you know, we got that, that glimpse into the future. You know, and initially we all thought it was just, oh, this is just a, you know, a summer thing, just a, a what-if kind of story. Well, no, it's not a what-if. It's a possible future now, and we're seeing it go into that. So there's so many different stuff that's got me excited, not only for bad books, but for all the other books, because of what we saw in Future State. Because if the Batman Future State can happen, all the other title Future States can happen. So I'm very, very excited on the uh, just the general DC universe, but especially the Bat books, because they're really doing heavy into the uh, future state. Do you feel that it can be changed, that it can be diverted, that it can be prevented at this point with where the storyline's oh, yeah. going? And, and, 100%. Uh, I think that's what, that's what this story is about, is diverting from future state. You know, and it's, you know, we're seeing, like, I'm, obviously we're going to see multiple Batmans. You know, you know, in Future State, we had one Batman who wasn't Bruce Wayne. I think once post-Fear State, post the Fallout, which would have been Future State, I think we're going to have two Batman out there. You know, and it's going to be interesting to see what happens with uh, Bruce and Jace out there, who is going to be Batman. Are we going to have Bruce and the cowl, or is Bruce going to step away for a little bit, or is Bruce going to do something different? You know, I think, I think, fear state, future state, and post future state are going to be, you know, some changes in the bad universe. And this is this is creating that. I'm looking forward to it. You you want to go and do the creative team real quick, yeah. and then we can um, chat some more about this because uh, actually I want to talk a little bit about Jace um, as, you're, as yeah. you're mentioning him. So why don't you go ahead and, and do that piece if you don't mind. Well, writer is James Tynion IV, artist is Ricardo uh, Federici, um, colorist uh, Chris Sotomayor with letters by Clayton Cowell, cover Bed Oliver with the very, various variant covers by Dylan Teague, Jorge Jimenez, Francisco uh, Martina, uh, Ben Mears is the assistant editor, Amadeo Tortoro is editor, Ben Abernathy is group editor, and of course, Bob Kane. Uh, Batman was created by Bob Kane with Bill Finger. This is a good-looking book, by the way. Uh, before I jump into talking about Jace, I really should say that. This Fear State Alpha was one heck of a page-turner, and visually, I really liked the style. I love the coloring. I love the tones. It really is... It's uh, it, The artwork in this was... It's a very, very pretty book. <laughs> and and the, I'll tell you, i got to throw out compliments to the colorist on yep. this one, big time. Yeah, now, Penn's a... Pencils, inks, all art, all that is very important, but I really, really love the colorist because of the different tones and different kind of hues they were using for the different sections. You got the whole Batman and uh, Scarecrow hue. You've got, you know, when it was the tech side, when you've got the gritty streets of Gotham. You've got, it's just all these variations. The opening salvo went in Arkham when uh, Saint is talking to uh, Crane, you know, just how bright that was because that would fit inside the asylum. So it was a really good job of as you're flipping through the pages because, you know, we always say colorist, the colors of the book, it's the soundtrack. You know, it sets the tone. It's that dun 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 build up for it. Well, the colors here did a great job with that. And really just, again, you know, as you're going through, just the different vibes and the different grooves of the section really helped out. So this right here was a fabulous uh, team on all, on all levels. Yeah, I agree. And it's a, the writing is fantastic. The artwork is just spectacular. Uh, it's, it's, it's a really, really good-looking book. I mentioned Jace, and uh, particularly I Am Batman number zero, and we'll, we'll talk um, loosely about that. Uh, I really love events like this where you're starting to get some of the other titles in the Bat universe that are converging on this. I'm Catwoman for obvious reasons with Alleytown. 
you're getting uh, Harley Quinn um, has, has a major role in this and her book's converging with this, which her book's outstanding. <laughs> but I Am Batman, number zero, um, really led into this in a pivotal way and almost helps the magistrate's cause of the smear campaign against vigilantes. Jace unwittingly paints a picture of Batman that they're looking to paint, uh, yeah. where Batman's caused a riot, Batman's attacked, Batman's done, and, and Jace is a catalyst of that. So Jace is going to have the responsibility to address that and deal with that. Uh, so it's going to be interesting to see when he and Bruce do eventually, because you know that's coming, right? Those two are going to eventually have a face-to-face. What is that relationship going to be like? And I can't wait to see that. I like that build. Uh, this presentation of uh, Batman, it's interesting. I'm, I'm torn with Jace uh, as far as what I want from Jace out of this. Do I want Jace to be Batman or do I want him to be some other original character? Um, I guess my preference would be uh, Bruce Wayne's Batman, and I would love to see Jace become something else. Yet, I'm really enjoying Jace as Batman. So, I mean, I like what they're doing with it. So it's almost like I'm contradicting myself, and I, I do that as a reader when I'm reading it, where I'm like, well, I want Bruce's Batman, which is, I am rock, rock solid in this. I guess what it is, is I don't want Jace replacing Bruce, but I love Jace. So I want to read more Jace. I'm very into Jace. I want to see it. Uh, I'm not against the idea of there being multiple Batman. We've seen that before, and I actually quite liked it when like Dick Grayson was Batman and Bruce was more the jet-setting Batman. Um, they've explored things like that. I don't know what they're going to do post all of this, you know, with uh, with Jace and with Bruce. I'm intrigued. So it's it, I'm not uncomfortable with it. I'm anxious to let these writers just take me through the ride because I like all the players on the table. I'm protective of Bruce, and I think that's where any of my reluctance when it comes to Jace being Batman is not because I dislike the character, or because I dislike the concept of him as Batman at all, I really like it. I just love Bruce. So I I want it all, and that's, I think, part of the issue with it. But I, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that. I like that he's a catalyst in this, though. I, I oh. Am Batman number zero is a must-read. I just I, I, For people out there, if you haven't read Future State, if you haven't read uh, Bat- Next Batman Second Son... You can jump on I Am Batman number zero, and it gives you everything you need. So I thought that was a very well-written issue as far as it really is a true zero issue, where it leads you up to Jace's involvement in Fear State and gives you everything you need to know about who Jace is, kind of where he's at right now, what his role is. So don't be afraid to jump on that book if you haven't been reading the other stuff and give this character a chance, because he is a really cool character. Oh, God, yeah. And I'll tell you, I... As you're talking, I, I, I agree with you. I love him as a character. Love him as Batman. You know, and I think it's kind of neat seeing his birth and his growth into the cowl mm-hmm. and him getting used to dealing with this stuff. And especially agree with you how they they played him. They played him well. He was a young, he's inexperienced. You know, and you know he gave them what they needed. And, and it stinks, but it's made for a great story. But as I'm saying that, I don't want to lose Bruce because Bruce is awesome. You know, so it's it's kind of like the whole same thing I have with uh, John, Kent, and uh, Clark. You know, I, I love him as Superman. I, I want to continue seeing stories of John Kent becoming Superman, but I don't want to lose Clark. I don't want to lose those stories. So it's, you know, I want my cake and I want to eat it too. So it's, you know, giving me more stories. And there's so many different things they could do with, you know, Jace as Batman. You know, you know, you think about it. You take the Batman book or the I Am Batman book, and that's Jace's Batman book. And then you have the Batman book or Detective Comics book where it's talking about Bruce and it's dealing with Bruce. And maybe we have some stories where Bruce is, you know, dealing with the problems outside of the cowl. Maybe we could actually get some cool detective stories or some type of different telling of his life. You know, where he's not wearing the collar. Because I think that would be some interesting stuff going on with him solving the problems, not as Batman. You know, there's so many different things they could do with this whole universe 
that I, I'll, I, I know you'd be in on it. I'd be 100% in on it. And you give me the right creator on this and you could have some epic stuff going on. You know, so I think, you know, and again, like you, I'm just I'm going to wait to see what we get out of this. But, you know, when you start seeing these strong developments of these new characters, you know, when Future State came out, they threw it at us. You know, I'm like, oh, OK, this could be interesting. This went me, you know. Yeah, and we had some debates going back and forth about what it could be. Now we're seeing the birth of it. Now we're seeing the birth of what that stuff is. Yep. And they're really fleshing out these characters and they're locking them in to the point where we want to see them. We don't want to see all the horrific stuff that happens to the city, you know, but we do want to see the bat. We want to see Jace's bat. We want to see some changes, you know, and I think this was a great way of handling it. Give us a taste of what it horrifically could be. And then hopefully along the ways we'll get a new version that's not the horrific, but is something. You know, you mentioned the fact that uh, now we're, we're getting like the ground floor, the entry level as far as where everything began. I loved that about this issue because it dawned on me as like Arkham Asylum many months ago. I'm like, yes, I want to know. I mean, and yes, the story has organically kind of given this to us, but now we're getting it spelled out. How did these two meet? How did they get connected? What was the actual relationship here? And you could see how like these two would turn each other on each other at any point in time. (laughs) And, and we're, that's where I think also a piece when you look at future state, where can it veer off? In the, re, the relationship of these two is very tentative. They're both opportunists. They're both out for themselves. They're both out not for credit. They're both out. They're actually out for credit for making a change and taking control of that change. They both want to be in charge and in different ways and from very different angles of where this is going. And this idea that this is all driven by research of Jonathan Crane into this idea of a fear state and how Gotham, this war that it's just gone through, has made Gotham the perfect candidate for this societal level change. It's a very different sort of attack. This is like, I I remember uh, back in the days of Cataclysm and No Man's Land where they, they did the earthquake and really shook up Gotham through the earthquake and no man's land and what they were doing there. This is that level of story where it's, it's a, it's not a direct attack on Batman. It's a direct attack on the city in a way that is, and that has never been done before. Yes, it is an attack on Batman and, and vigilantes in general, because in order for this new society to work, the powers that be really have to control the societal change. They have to take advantage and have nothing that is going to get in the way of them changing uh, and, and where they're going. Jonathan Crane's idea that like he's obsessed with the research, obsessed with seeing this play out, but in the end, this idea that, you know, I'm kind of being altruistic with this. I really do, and he, I believe it. He really believes the end result of this is going to be a better Gotham. I don't agree with him because this is not the way to achieve a better society. But you can see how somebody like him and Saint would believe in this as being something that's better for the city and them knowing best what's better for the city. It's very, very interesting. This storyline has me glued. And this opening part of the issue, I don't, this would not have been better at the beginning of all this, in Future State, us knowing all this. I like that you, everything we've been fed before, like, is brought together in these moments. We've been given all this, yes, I love it being spelled out this way now. Now is the time for this. In such a gorgeous set of pages. That's really a good-looking set of pages because it's pretty critical in this that, to your point about colors and tone and all of that, I agree. On top of that, the pencils and inks, here's where they're critical. They have some close-up shots there. You're a smart man. I've read about you, of course. Your work in defense robotics, how you use psychology to help program your machines. The look on Jonathan Crane's face there. My gosh, is this artwork just stunning. Um, because you see a vibe, a move, a, a mood, a passion off of Jonathan Crane that 
we're so used to seeing him in the Scarecrow costume, and when he doesn't have that on, it's almost like many times he's more meek. Yeah. But when now we're seeing him passionate about his work, about his research, and about where it can go, and talking with somebody who he can really rap about with it, you know, and really have a depth-filled conversation with it, this is a critical juncture in this story. And wow, is there a passion, a mood, and a tone in this from Jonathan Crane that I am digging something fierce. This is great writing, great artwork right here. I know, I'll tell you, I love see again, I'm echoing right along with you on these opening sequences. And this was perfect timing for it. And you know, this again was one of those beautiful meshings of art and sto- art and story. You know, I, you know, the, the sequence when he's sitting there, you know, you want to flatter me. You call me Dr. Train. You try to project a version of me you are, would be comfortable speaking with. But I frighten you. Don't die, Mr. Stink. Mr. Stink. Tremendously. And the look of fear on his face, the look of intimidate, that, se- that one panel right there is just outstanding. And I love this because, again, we're seeing the intelligence of Crane. You know, he is... A brilliant doctor. He is not just some crazy, you know, in a funny costume who sprays a fear toxin. He is a master of fear. He doesn't need the toxins to scare people. He can do it without any chemicals. He knows. He understands this. This is something, you know, that is his true life's work. And I love seeing that level of passion. I love seeing that just that that commitment to it. And again, the intelligence of him. This right here was a beautiful dance back and forth. And you, you, you're wondering who's going to double cross who, who's going to, you know, you know, how is the double cross going to happen? When is it going to happen? What's going to be the final say? And you get to the end there where the most important thing to him, he wants the credit. He's seen people take and dissect his work and take credit for it while he is just labeled a cartoon villain. I love that sequence right there because, again, it adds to the fact of more of what he's doing, why he's doing it. This isn't about conquering Gotham. This isn't about taking over the world. This is about proving he was right. This is about proving that his fear state can evolve society. And those are always the, you know, the best Lex Luthor stories we always talk about are where he's not being the maniacal villain, but he's doing what he thinks is right. You know, he, yeah, you got to kill a couple people to you know do it, but the ends justify the means. Same thing right here with Crane. He believes Gotham will be better off after going through this complete hell they're creating. One of the things I really loved about this sequence, too, is you see him feeling out how much to tell Saint. Yeah. By his reactions. He's tentative in the conversation, but intrigued. And you see it emotionally delivered in his body tone. A lot of times, you know, uh, artists will rely heavily on facial features for that. This is more than that. It's it's the facial features. It's the body posture. It's uh, it's it's poses. It's motion. You can see him on Saint and in Crane. I really felt the art piece here was just such an amazing. You feel like the camera panning around a living event yeah. here. And I really love the camera angles that were chosen by the artist. Uh, it, it's really a cinematic piece. This is a story I eventually would love to see. I, I, I carefully want to see animated. I almost want to see it be an HBO Max miniseries. Uh, you know, in because there's there's a Batman. I know there's a Batman series that's coming. Uh, a Batman animated series. I don't know if that's the vehicle for this or even a la Titans, or there's a Peacemaker series coming. Um, you're seeing like stuff like this on like Disney Plus, where they're doing you know these extended long form um, stories, like you see with Loki and uh, and uh, Falcon and Winter Soldier and and things like that. WandaVision, great example. This I would love to see. Not that I love the animated features. If they would do like a three part animated feature, maybe. Um, to yeah. do it like this. This is a story, though, I would love to see more long form. And, uh, you know, with, with chapters to it. The direct to, DC, the direct to DVD or direct to digital animated releases that we've seen are spectacular. So I'm leaning towards, I'd love to see it be 
three of those <laughs> yeah. not making any sense. Um, it's I feel this story. I want to see it totally fleshed out. Uh, and I would love to see them have the wiggle room for that um, or, or at least have those creators involved in some form of HBO Max series from this, because I do think this is a story that's worthy of being told on the screen on some level where it's live, whether it's live action or animated. I, and I don't really care which I, I in some ways, maybe both at some point, <laughs> you know, cause you know what I'm, what I mean is if you have an ongoing like live action series, eventually you can see this play out. If you do it animated and they're going to be different, right? Because of the different delivery methods and we've seen stories play out animation and then play out in live action. And, and I, I really, I mean, we've seen it happen in live action multiple times that way. So I, I love this stuff. Uh, but this story in particular is exceeding my expectations in its delivery. Yeah. Oh, God, yeah. And I, I love the choice to have Saint sit the entire time, but Crane never sat once. Yeah, yeah. You know, Crane's standing and, you know, and everything you talk about is body posturing. You know, just the initial, you know, and then he moves in close and then he backs off, you know, and then they, there's that one panel where he's kind of like hunched over and thinking. And you, it, it was a really cool moment because, again, it gives that fluidity and that motion on a still page. You know, I, I really dig that. But this, again, this was a great way to open this issue up, but I completely agree with you that this needed to be told now. After we have a heavy thing, give us – this is kind of one of those now you know the rest of the story. Now you know the flashback to where it came from and where this was you know, born. And you know, it's, it's kind of neat stuff. I like when I get that kind of stuff where you get a flash to the past you know, so you can explain details that you've already seen. So. I love that you mentioned the fact that Simon Saint sits the whole time because it's brilliant. It shows the – uh, dare I say the strategery of Simon State? <laughs> because here's the part about that where it shows him being confident and in control. In that sequence, he knows what he needs from Crane here. He needs an empowered Jonathan Crane. The only way you're going to get that is if you let Jonathan Crane navigate and control the room. Let Jonathan Crane be the puppet master in this. Let him do his pieces. In that, in that moment... Simon Saint is controlling the room just as much as Jonathan Crane is. He is letting this play out the way that he needs it to. And understanding that Jonathan Crane, he needs, he wants the full Jonathan Crane. He doesn't want the one that hides himself uh, behind the mask. He wants the Jonathan Crane that, well, he got the mask on, the mask off, doesn't matter. I want the brilliant scientist. I want every level of Jonathan Crane here. And he gets it. it it's such a great sequence because of that. And you're right. And it, a lot of that is the, the choice of having Simon Saint sit the whole time was so well written. In this. Yep. It worked really well. I love Scarecrow's costume in this. When we finally get to see him in Arkham Asylum now, and you see how the whole area has evolved because he's gotten his tech and he's running the place. Uh, and you see this sequence with Batman. By the way, beautiful rendition of Batman here. It's I, I love the I, talk about shading and tone again. When you talk about the color work, the art is terrific. It's amazing how you've got a really strong colorist that understands the what the story is trying to deliver in tone. They only enhance the great artwork that's already there. This, my gosh, the light source shading and everything that's going on here. I really, really dig the look of Batman here and Crane. Um, Crane almost seems like a creature, and you see why people would be terrified of him. And I like the like the fingers with the straw that almost looks like it's needles coming out of his fingers. The the choices there are just like so creepy and so good that uh, it, it's I, I I just love that. They've embraced the best of Scarecrow and yet somehow made him even creepier. So when you see him on TV screens in the shadows, you get why people would even be, be even more terrified by this. Oh, yeah. Oh, big time. And it's funny. the When they first started showing the look on Crane, I was like, I don't know about this. You know, you know it, it, it was a different look. 
You know, but as things start playing out, you're like, okay, I see what he's going for. Because it wasn't just about the fear toxins. And I think that, again, is one of the neat things about this story from the beginning. You know, I don't think we haven't had a, a fear toxin attack, really, except for, you know, some recent gassing of uh, Peacekeeper 1 and of, um, of Bat. There is no mass gassing. Yet people are just as afraid of him. When they had the fake scarecrows popping up in different spots, he was building fear without chemicals. So it was a more natural fear. It was a natural you know, thing there. And that, to be honest, is more devastating than a chemically induced one. So I thought that for me was really deep. But again, playing this sequencing, man, I absolutely love, love this color. Playing off of what came before, though. These are people are already afraid. You don't need to scare yeah. them. They're already there. You just need to push that fear and make them think. You know, it's it's almost at this point it's free will to embrace your fear. It's <laughs> funny because once again I asked the question: Why would you ever live in Gotham? <laughs> I, I, yeah, I'd move. Uh, this this like this going on right now. You know what the problem would be though? Like you've got your money in your home right now. I would imagine, like, right now we have this problem in Ohio where, like, if you sell your home, like, people are going to give you more money for it <laughs> than what you're yeah. looking for uh, because it's right, it really is right now, a, a strangely, a seller's market. And, like, homes, like, don't stay on the market very long. But in Gotham right now, I'm assuming that even in the current economy right now, yeah. that Gotham would have trouble selling the homes. Like, property values probably be at an all-time low. I don't see a lot of people going, I would like to move to Gotham. So I think that would be the big problem, is, like, if you've got all your equity in your home, you're not going anywhere. <laughs> yeah, uh, <laughs> I'd take the loss. <laughs> I, I would, too. If, if you, loss. But you if you what? can afford there's, to. There's some things more important than money. <laughs> yeah. If you can afford to, of course. Um, I really... Loved that about this story, though. Um, and you're right. You're nailing it. Uh, I, The idea that this is a city that you're seeing through the newscast, this is a great use of newscasts. Yep. Because you're seeing, you, today's journalism is all about people having personalities and putting a spin on everything. So you're seeing that happening here, how the media is being used as a way to only incite further pieces of it at all levels the smear campaign on the insanity collective and linking them with scarecrow is amazing it, it's working and people are buying into this it's it's all opportunity and peacekeeper even though you know he's been sprayed with the toxin and everything like that at this point it doesn't matter it matters how they're spinning the story of the peacekeepers and the magistrates and simon saint and I love that, and, and the and the mayor, and what's going on here. I out, yeah. it's going to be interesting out of this when this is all said and done, what the landscape of Gotham is going to look like. Like who is going to be in charge? Uh, what what does that look like? What does the police force look like? What does City Hall look like? It's the power structure of Gotham out of this is going to be something to watch because if you can topple the powers that be. Who's going to be in charge? What, what's that? What does that look like? What happens to the Unsanity Collective? Do they survive this? And what what avenue and do they take out of all this? Uh, there's a lot going on here that it's not just this story. It's what does Gotham look like? You know, when, when you got Joshua Williamson that's going to be taking over at uh, two eighteen. You know, what's that going to look like? It's it's going to be very interesting to see. Well, and I tell you, media manipulation is something that we see present in the real world. Oh, so yeah. when you get stuff like that in comics, it's absolutely wonderful. You know, and I'm, I'm right along with you how I love when they do these pages of the media and they do these multiple news stories and they're flashing to different people. So you can see it's not just one network saying this across the board they're saying this. so wherever you are if you know you're like i'm channel this guy that's the only that's the only channel i listen to you're hearing this but if you're not if you're over there you're hearing this it does not matter where you're going you're 100 percent getting this fed to you 
And we know that, you know, uh, you know, Mahone, uh, Sean Mahoney, Peacekeeper One, the hero of uh, A-Day, is not a hero. He was a monster. He was one of the worst guards yep. in one of the worst places, you know, to be. But he's being labeled this great hero, you know. And I love, again, you know, how the media loves two things. They love to, you know, they love telling a bad, uh, you know, bad news because bad news sells uh, papers. And they love... You know, giving you the hero that you can root for. You know, and it's kind of neat. The only thing they like more is toppling that hero. So I'm curious to see if we're going to get a, you know, a breakdown of who the peacekeeper is. Is that, you know, can they, can the saint and can the mayor keep control over the media? Because once they lose the media, that's it. You know, you think about it, this attack on Batman. This attack on the vigilantes is all coming from mayor's office, from the media and all that stuff. You know, all these people who last year were like, yay, Batman, yay, Team Bat, we love you, are now turning on them. Why? Because they're being told repeatedly, you know, hey, this is uh, a bad thing. Then you get Jace when he's he gets he messes up a little bit. And so we got these images. Let's feed that to the machine. You know, so it's but again, the machine can turn on. The machine can very easily turn on the magistrate. The machine can very easily turn on peacekeeper. So I love seeing this stuff, knowing that you know right now they're in control. But what happens if they don't? And I liked with Saint, he recognizes this. They got Mahoney out there sprayed with the fear toxin. They do not want him, you know, going off on going off half crazy and killing people or doing something else. So what's he do? He completely takes control of all the media. He 100% controls everything. So if anybody does happen to get images of him, they're not going to be able to get it out. And I love seeing that. I want to correct one thing I said. Josh Williamson takes over 118. Somehow I manufactured in my head an additional 100 issues of Batman that happened. I got to tell you, Jim, the story was great. <laughs> <laughs> the missing 100 issues. It is great. It's, it's a whole additional run that uh, it's in my head. Some of it's scary, <laughs> as you can guess, because of that. <laughs> but, uh, yes, 118 that he's taking over. Uh, you mentioned the landscape of Gotham, and we'd be remiss if we didn't talk about the Gotham City Police Department and Renee Montoya. I've really enjoyed her in this, because she's somebody who traditionally has had a strong relationship with the Capes, um, and has been one, as the question, yet... She believes in Gotham and believes in bringing order to Gotham. She took over this job because she thought that they really were trying to ramp up the importance of the police and really use law and order to truly take control of Gotham. And she's seeing some chinks in the armor right now to the point where she's livid over what's happening here because she knows she's being given a runaround. And mm-hmm. she knows that now everything that she's put on the line, her reputation, the direction she's been taking things in, it's all questionable at the moment. And I, I loved her reaction and the fact uh, how upset that she gets over it. And she knows that these infomercials and things like that, she's been played. What she's going to do out of this is going to be incredibly interesting. Where does she go from here? Uh, they've got. She's got to pull out the old ham radios and walkie talkies, but she knows now that somebody has taken the Gotham City Police Department and knocked them down. The same way that they have the vigilantes, it just looks different. The magistrate program has taken over in a way that this isn't support for the police. This is a replacement for the police because the police can't be trusted to follow the program. Mm-hmm. So she gets it right now. She sees the writing on the wall of where this is going. Yeah, I always thought if someone you know, wasn't corrupt, you know, and and or you know, you could take this concept of the magistrate, and instead of it being these outside goon squad, you mm-hmm. armor up Gotham PD. Yep. You actually give Gotham PD these resources. Because that's something that if you know the Gotham PD had the overhead um, the spaceship, if they had the armor, if they had the tech to take down things, they could seriously do some good. 
if, you know, they, if there wasn't again, if there wasn't the corruption in the police department exactly, too the corruption you know so it's it's one of those things where I, you know you look at this and you're like this you know so in a way i can kind of understand what the mayor is doing i don't think he's pure evil i think he's just misguided and you know he's trusting obviously trusting the wrong person right you know and he's very clouded in his judgment on you know, his own personal experiences and dealing with the various masks and the various clowns that happened in Gotham and all that, all the, the, the weirdness that is Gotham City, you know, that has kind of corrupted him and clouded his judgment. You know, and it's one of those, everybody has the, everybody has classic, you know, you know, we all have our faults, you know, and, and his fault right now is he's got his blinders on when it comes to, you know, when it comes to the vigilantes. Yeah, there's some problems, but there's also some good. And he's he's only seeing this one idea. He's focused on one idea, this one concept of this outside entity that's not the police, de- the corrupt police department, but it can actually save the city. And you know, it's, it's he's a neat character in that they could very easily make him just a maniacal villain, but they chose not to make him that way. He's still the bad guy of the story because he's anti the heroes and he's getting played by Saint, but he's not again one of those conquer the world, you know, twirl my mustache <laughs> kind of villains. And I, I like that about him. And you know, and seeing him and Renee, because again, as you said with Renee, she's been a mask. She knows both sides, the cop as well as the vigilante side of the, the spectrum. So she could very easily do some amazing stuff in Gotham, just like Gordon was trying to do. She very easily could continue on that kind of path. But the situation, her hands are tied. And she's getting played, and she's getting the you know, she's getting the police force is getting their kneecaps taken out from underneath them. So it's, you know, this again, this whole story of Renee, the mayor, that is a side story going on in this whole fear state, but it's also a side story that I would love to read. They could do a Renee, a fear state mini series, Renee Montoya and the Gotham PD. And it would be amazing. You know, if you, you know, and you know, and I, I, I tell you, there's so many different side stories they could do on this. And I think that is the strength of this whole fear state, future state, you know, just the bat universe itself. There's so many different ways they could go with stories. And I I wish we could see them all and we're not going to obviously, but you know, I'm really just, I'm again, if you can't tell them loving this, I'm loving Renee throughout this. It's funny. It came up a few episodes ago about um, too many bat books. You know, are there too many bat books? As you were talking about that Renee Montoya series, I was thinking to myself, this would be a great time, you know, after fear state, to institute a new Gotham Central series. Oh yeah, oh, you know yeah. where love where that. and and why? So why would we need another bat bat book in that case? Because of the fact that you can really focus on the police department and have it be police procedural. So it's a different kind of book for the DC universe in general. Uh, and and that's that's one of those things. I don't care if it's a bat book. Off of that, actually, I like that it would be a bat book because. It's fun to see that from the angle of the police. What does this all look like? But I think right now, with all of the changes, what does Gotham Central look like post-Fear State? And seeing what police procedural looks like post-Fear State would be brilliant. I'd love to see that. So I was nodding as you were going on about miniseries. I'm like, miniseries? I'd like to see an ongoing. Um, and I'm, I'm not, that's not disputing you. It's me being greedy. No, no. Because like when you, were, when you were saying you want your miniseries, I'm nodding. I'm like, yeah, right, right, right. And then, well, let's, and maybe that mini, maybe a miniseries you're talking about would lead into an ongoing, um, you know, if it's successful. And I so and why do you put a bat book label on that? Well, because of the fact that truly that will draw people to read it. Where if you did a straight up DC Universe police procedural that wasn't linked, uh, you might not get the the readership initially. It, Gotham it, uh, Gotham Central was brilliant as a series. It, God, it. Gotham Central would probably do a lot better than if they did protect and serve. Where they did yeah. one, you know, one series was Gotham, another series was Metropolis, another series was Central City. But if they have a book where it's solely wait, focused on wait, Gotham wait. Central, can I pause you? Can I pause better. you for one second? Yeah, I want that book you just talked about. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I would oh, love yeah. to read Protect and Serve. So you're pitching a book that I'm like, wait, I don't know. I kind of like this book Jim's laying out, where like every like every arc is like a different city. 
I'm like, that I, could, I that, would love that. That would be that, to sweet. Me, would be the dream. Yeah, you know, right there. Just like that, I would love a military book that shows the the U.S. military, you know, or even foreign military as well in a superhero universe. Couldn't that be protect and serve though? Because like it's funny as you're as you're laying out that book, I'm like, well, that's not just police. Then you could do fire, you could do military, yeah. you could do like so. Uh, that would be a great book because like every arc could be it could be kind of like what Legends of the Dark Knight was where every arc is a different creative team tackling stories set in the DC universe featuring um, first responders and in, in a wide variety of very grounded, very rooted situations and very big situations. Uh, it, it doesn't matter because I think the you could really do the full gambit with that. Uh, I'd love a book like that. The problem, here's the reality. The problem with that is, I think that book would, if you put the right creators on it, that book would do well initially. But then, if you haven't tacked it on to, like, Batman or something like that, it it, it would drift off eventually. Not because of quality, it just happens. It, 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 and that's the problem. Because I love that book. I would love that book. Oh, God, yeah. And, and again, it's, you know, I, I agree with you. It, it, I don't think it would last. Yeah, unfortunately, I think there would be a, it would get a pop and then it would slowly fade out, you know, and it would be very difficult to keep the interest going on that story, you Mm -hmm. know, and part of the thing, changing different cities could possibly help or changing, you know, you know, you have a police story, then you do a one shot of a fire, uh, another one shot of search and rescue, you know, after some big event, you know, happens, you know, and the city is like destroyed, they show a search and rescue kind of dealing with, uh, you know, their circumstance, you know, and it ties into some big cat, you know, catastrophe or something like that. And, but in the end, you know, if you just being, being completely blunt with each other in the end, if it doesn't have that big single connection, Batman, Superman, Wonder Woman, Wonder Woman, Green Lantern, you know, any of that big connection, it will slowly fade out, you know, unfortunately, because that's just history has shown us that. So I, I don't know. I, I would love again. I'm, th- this is a book I would love to see and I would be 100 percent backing it and I would be giving it multiple ways just to try to support it. You know, but it's I don't know. I don't know if we would ever see something like that, which stinks. I you know, love it would- stuff like this. You see how cool a police department story could be. With this art team. Yeah. Like a Gotham Central book. Let's, let's, let's go back to Gotham Central. Um, a Gotham Central book with this art team as an ongoing? Please. Okay. Please. I want, this, yeah. I want this art team as an ongoing on anything. I'd love, I'd love to see this art team. It, uh, it just, it's a great art team. Hey, jump into another character group, Oracle. Yeah. My gosh. I didn't see where that was going. And I, I mean, I, there was a point where it like, uh Oh, this isn't going to go well. Um, nope. but, but I didn't initially think that I thought, okay, Oracle's going to gain some traction here. It's just to get a message out. And maybe this is going to be maybe the opening salvo from the heroes. And I love that. It wasn't, it really added this sense of danger and, I, I felt like Ed Dumb afterwards as, as like when, when it hit that point where I'm like, oh, oh, yeah. Oh, I should have seen that coming. Yeah. And, and I did when they when they started talking about plugging in. I'm like, oh, wait a minute. That's not going to go well at all. I, I, <laughs> I loved this. I loved the sequence and I loved how it played out. I liked that the message I'm like, wait, how is the message already being sent out when Oracle hasn't even... And that was the brilliance of it. They had planned all along for Oracle to send out a message. And they took control of it. It was so... For the purpose of being able to track down Oracle so that way they could fry Oracle systems so that way Oracle could not be a thorn in their side. What a brilliant tactic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll be honest, I love this. I absolutely love this. You know, and I'm a huge Oracle fan. Me too. And I, you know, I always look forward to when she's knocked down and how she fights back. How does Oracle rebound from this one? You know, that's always the big key. What's she going to do next? Because you think back to uh, Future State, Barbara Gordon was kidnapped, you know, through most of it. 
you know, she was offline throughout all of that stuff. So this is the beginning of taking Oracle offline. You know, if she gets captured again, if she's not able to be Oracle, that's going to be the bad girls are going to kind of get thrown off their game and they're going to get separated and they're not going to be the focused unit that if they're focused together, you put the full units together, you know, one common goal, one common mission, they're unstoppable. You know, this is the first opening salvo into what we saw in Future State, take out Oracle. Now they got to physically take out Oracle is their next plan, which, again, I'm assuming is going to happen in future issues or something. But it's kind of neat seeing this play out, knowing where it could potentially go. You know, so I'm like, I'm all in on this. I'm 100% going, this is awesome. Now, the one thing I do want to know is how they did it. You know, who is the tech per is it Saint, the sole tech person, or is there did he recruit somebody else for the point of taking out Oracle? Because he's brilliant uh, tech wise. You know, but was it also Saint and somebody else? You know, was this, you know, a team effort? You know, kinda like how he's working with Scarecrow. Was he working with somebody else to take out Oracle? Or was this all Saint who took out Oracle? I, that's the kind of, those are the kind of questions that raise my head and get me wondering, and Jim, is there somebody else? Let's be honest. That's a, that's The questions you're asking are too big to be contained into this story. They require a miniseries that leads to an ongoing. And yeah. a miniseries that leads to an ongoing should be Birds of Prey. Um, yes. It's, I... As I was watching 100%. this, I was just watching this sequence. I'm like, oh man, this needs to be a Birds of Prey book. Like, please, yes, <laughs> hear my prayers, 100%. because right I love you, these man. characters. And and the Oracle sequence was great. I I Gotham, this like you talk about, I call it a bat book. I don't care what you call it, what kind of label you put it. Birds of Prey to me kind of skirted the lines of being a bat book plus, you know, where it like had its own like flavor. Uh, I. I so want a Birds of Prey book back after seeing this sequence. I, I mean, I've enjoyed Oracle returning, but, uh, or, or, you know, do a, do a Batgirl book with, with both Cass and um, Stephanie and, you know, Oracle kind of running the ship. I, I really like to see Birds of Prey though, because you can put in Huntress and, uh, well, Black Canary is going to be over in the Deathstroke book, right. um, which, which I'm excited about. I mean, Deathstroke Inc. and that type of thing is going to be great. So I, I don't know. I just I think there's room. There's characters that could easily populate a Birds of Prey book right now. Oh God, yeah, yeah. And again, it's with the the Gotham going the way it's going. It needs the Birds of Prey. We need that. I like the converging Harley Quinn story and Catwoman story. With, yes. With the um, the way they're handling Poison Ivy, I they've really turned that into intriguing mystery. Where part of Poison Ivy is with Catwoman, and the other part now is uh, colder, more emotionless, and is with uh, Harley Quinn. And I really love that playing out where this is where Harley's used to going for refuge. I like their relationship a lot. I didn't, like, I've always loved Ivy and Harley when they've done the team-ups with the two of them. But this idea that their relationship is advanced and evolved now... Um, to being a genuine love between the two of them is something that I, I'm i digging in the animated series. I'm digging it here. I, I think it fits different kinds of storytelling. This one in particular, I love the relationship. And if you'd told me five years ago that that was going to be a relationship I'm really digging, I wouldn't have like laughed at it, but I wouldn't have seen the substance to it. You know what I mean? I, th- I would have thought it was something that was done... Uh, to more to represent the times than for it to be a relationship of substance. This is well written. It's a relationship of substance. I love the relationship. This is the way you do this. Like I like this relationship a lot, and I'm protective of it now. Uh, this is a great way to build upon a relationship, and I want to see these two wind up together in the end because what we're building is this intriguing story of how hard it is for the two of them even to find. Ivy's way back to her who she is <laughs> and and how Ivy's changed spinning out of this is going to be very interesting and what it means for their relationship I'm intrigued about this the way I'm intrigued about Bruce and Selena yes. and that's I, I was like when I read this issue I'm like wow I'm really invested in Harley and Ivy as a couple and it's been done so organically and I think that's the piece that's been done really well it wasn't like boom for shock value 
it was done organically and really well told. And I'm like, boy, if this is where we're going as far as opening up different kinds of relationships in uh, in comics, in the DC Universe in particular, I'm like, this is really kind of a model you should follow. Because I said, uh, like, out of nowhere, I'm like sitting here like, boy, I really care about these two a lot more than I even realized. Like, I'm really invested in the relationship. That happens very often with me. Uh, but... I was surprised with this relationship, how invested I am in it, in this issue. And I really am. I love this couple. <laughs> oh, big time. Big time agree with you, man. And I'll tell you, one of the things that I got to give compliments on how the birth of this relationship, how they developed it. You know, this very easily could have been shock value. This very easily could have been just hardly, you know, throw yourself at the very next person who looked at her nicely, you know, you know, to get over, you know, dealing with all the crazy, all the stuff that happened with Joker. You know, this very easily could have been that kind of story, yeah. but they didn't make it that. They made it an actual true relationship. And I think that is something that really goes to, throws kudos to the creative team behind this. And it's, this has spanned multiple books, multiple stories, and it's really let it grow and be, you know, a tr this is a true relationship. As true as Lois and Clark, Bruce and Selena, you know, Harley and Heidi are a name, you know, that said right in equal footing with that. Barry and Iris, you know, this is a, this is a great relation. This is a great couple, a great relationship. And I really do want to see this. I want to see Ivy back to being Ivy and, you know, her and Harley together. I, I want to see a happy ending for these two people because yes. you think about it, you know, in their, each one of them have killed people. Yes. Each one of them is technically classified as a villain, but each one of them has kind of, you kind of understand where they're coming from, you know, and you kind of see, you know, the stuff that happened to Harley, you know, that made her Harley. You see the stuff that happened to Ivy that made her Ivy. You see, you know, Ivy, you know, in it, in her own sense, she's not the maniacal villain who wants to conquer the world. She wants to save it. She wants to save the planet. It's she's that eco terrorism. But to be honest, it's she's looking at the again. She's looking at making the place better, not destroying it. But again, the the problem you run into with you know with a lot of this stuff with a lot of these villains is they don't have a problem killing somebody to to for their end goals. The ends justify the means, and you know that's one of the reasons that makes them villains. But there's still this human, this compassion, this love that they're able to feel. And we're getting that and we're seeing that. And included in, again, brilliant writing where you can have these serious moments and then you have the flash of comedy with it. You know, I love the, the gardener's comment about, you know, Lady Robot Joker and her friends. And, and Molly's like, hey, I just like this color green. It does not mean the Joker. And Harley's like, what? Really? You're not a clown at all? You know, that little pay couple pages was a very funny little moment, a very true Harley moment, but then it doesn't take away from the magnitude of what these people are dealing with. They're looking for refuse. They've got children who are being killed and maimed and injured and whatnot. So they're looking for this safe hiding spot, and they've got Queen Ivy, who is not the most compassionate person. So I love this sequence, man. The way that it converged into the whole Selena story and this idea about Batman being dead. Is he really dead? Again, leading into what we know is happening in Fear State. I'm sorry, in, in Future State. This, this really has me... Talk about building a fear factor. I don't want Future State to happen. I want Future State to be prevented. I want them to find a way to win the future state not to become the true state the the writings on the wall here and this is the real dangerous piece like the, the for what we know as readers from future state and i think you're right as far as like seeing this like if this could happen any of it could happen i think that's on the table i think so even if they went out in this I think a lot of future state is still up in the air as potential possibilities. But, man, am, am I just digging the whole the play out of this whole thing, what it looks like, seeing Jace, you know, like the building blocks of Jace getting the bat suit that we ended up seeing him with, and Bruce ultimately escaping. 
uh, in a sequence where it's already too late. Like, Bruce knows about this at a time where he can't prevent it because it's already happening. It's, like, in play right now. So I love the opening issue of this in that this is not something Batman can prevent. It's happening. It's how do you stop what's happening? Because uh, you can't, the prevention part's gone, long since gone. Um, what a great, great ending to this issue. I just, uh, at the end of it, I like immediately read it again, not having anything to do with the fact that we were going to talk about it. I, there's, it's a very dense read because there's so much going on in this that I just wanted to go back and digest it again. And I wanted to see that pretty artwork. Uh, my second read through is not like a typical like, you know. You, you and I both talk about the fact how we like to go, and you got me kind of hooked on this. The art read through, I will say, my second read through of this was a second read through. I went through and I re- <laughs> I just digested the whole story again. Uh, this has just been. I, I've gone back to this issue multiple times. Sometimes just kind of like browsing through and just kind of marveling at just artwork, dialogue. Um, it's been a very interesting way that I've read this. And I love when comics push me to go back and I just want to page through it. Just page through it. Sometimes just casually paging through it is such a fun thing. And this story had that for me. Oh, big time. Big time, man. I'll, I'll, again, echoing everything you were saying about with you know my normal read-through, I did my normal read through, read it, art read through, then again, another read through, but like read throughs four, five, six, and seven were, you know, peace reads. Like I, I focused on that in opening the, the, uh, the crane insane sequence focused on the Oracle piece. And it was like, I was jumping to different parts, going, I want to reread that again. And, you know, just, and you digest it and you take your time with and, and that's when I got thinking off page all these different stuff that are like, oh, they could do this, oh, they could do that. And, you know, again, it's, it shows, again, and it's not just the story that I was loving, it was the story and the artwork combined. This, again, this is a great creative team that, you know, I, it's, this is an epic story. You want to talk hardware season one? Yes. Nothing like the handy-dandy electro-claw for carving through metal doors. Our next discussion is going to be Hardware Season 1, Episode 1. Written by Brandon Thomas, pencils by Dennis Cohen, inks by Bill Sienkiewicz, colors by Chris Sotomayor, letters by Rob Lay, cover by Matthias Manhani, old-school variant cover by Dennis Cohen and Chris Sotomayor, uh, new School Variant Cover by Bill Sienkiewicz. 125 Variant Cover by Ricardo Lopez Ortiz. Edited by Amadeo Tur- Turo. Assistant Editor Marquise Draper. And Senior Editor Chris Conroy. And Reginald Hudland and Dennis Cohen are the producers of Milestone Media. And apologies for any name butchery. I gotta say, I've been loving all of these Milestone books. I knew the least about this, and I think because of that, I found myself loving it the most. Um, it was a, it's, this was a great read for me. I knew nothing about hardware when I went into this one. Like it was out of the three books that have come out so far, I didn't know anything. So I was anticipating and excited to read this, but I was like, oh, I hope I like it. Um, I loved this. I, this is a really, really terrific story. Um, what was your experience with this? Like, is this is this something you were digging as much as I am? Because I totally was shocked by this one. Yeah, I'll tell you, it's, again, like you, I have absolutely zero interactions with hardware before this. But, again, with all these milestone stuff, I'm really digging this. And the thing I liked about this issue over, you know, and I thought it was, I felt it had a different vibe to it than the other ones did. Yes. This one took... It's high action going on, but they didn't just focus on the high action. You know, we've got some really cool fight sequences where he's throwing down, showing exactly how tough he is. But there's still the whole intrigue and the double cross and the betrayal story arc playing out within, interwoven within the action. So you're getting a cool action story, but you're also getting a cool intrigue story. You know, and I think that for me was kind of a neat you know, twist on this story. You know, like, you know, you think back to what we had on the other milestone, we had either pretty good action or we had some story development and get a nice blending and really good source. This one had a really cool dance 
of the you know the combinations. And again, same thing art styling on this one. You know, this one has a little bit grittier art style than the other ones did. And it fit this guy because he, he's a little bit of a grittier he- hero. He is throwing down and blowing stuff up and doing some really cool stuff that, you know, I, I, I really dig this guy. I want to see more about him. I want to read more about him. But it wasn't just the physical stuff, how he could do it. I want to learn who this guy is. And I think that, for me, was a great way to introduce this character to me. You know, we we got the other, the milestone introduction thing, that this is a direct lead-in from that direct, you know, so, if you know, if you read that, you know, this page starts right after that. So it's kind of a neat, you know, connection to that. But if you didn't read that, if you're jumping in here, you're fine story-wise. And I think that, for me, was a great usage of, one, if people did read that, you get something. If they didn't read that you get something. So this was, again, one of those beautiful balances. I love the season approach to these three books. Like, I'm really liking all three books a great deal. Hardware, I th- I'm just really intrigued by. Like, the story this opening up with this idea. At first, I'm like, did he do this? Did he not do it? And then I'm like, oh, wait a minute. No, he's more saying this is what people think I am right now. Yeah. They think I'm this criminal who's done this horrible thing. And that's because of a smear campaign of somebody I trusted. Somebody I shouldn't. Somebody who was like a father figure to him has smeared, done this smear ca- campaign on him. Somebody who has benefited w- while this father figure is making this this assumption that, like, well, I did so much for this kid. This kid owes me and you know, that type of thing. I would make the strong argument that finding that talent in this kid, this kid has done as much for him in advancing him as he has done for the kid. And I love that about hard work. Curtis. Curtis is like just a really, really cool, cool guy. I should say kid. Um, I liked the way that organically through the story, we're seeing and getting to know bits and pieces about him. To your point, I want to know him more. I like the way that it's a balance between us getting to know him out of the costume as an adult, getting to know him as a kid, and really a heavy focus on getting to know him as hardware. And why, like, we should care about him when it's weird to, like, is he a hero? Is he somebody who's seeking revenge for circumstances? Is he somebody who's trying to stop an atrocity? He's so many, like, a bundle of things. I like that it's it feels non-traditional in its approach because I'm having, I don't know that I'm pinning down exactly what he is because I think he's a, a, a mishmash of a bunch of things. Um, but I find that I like him, which is really important. Right out of the starting gate in issue one, I am intrigued by who Hardware is. Ultimately, when he gets like his revenge, when he shuts all this down, where does he go from there? What is what is he going to do? What is going to be his motivations? Um, I really am excited to go on this journey. I love the season concept because I, I'm all in for season one of this. And yet seeing the potential for season two, season three, season four, this is an interesting sort of delivery method. I like the way that they're approaching this. You know, they're embracing the miniseries idea, but tying it into binge watching television like you do today. This yep. is this is a really cool way to approach this. I've been buying these issues because I want to support them because I like the books, but I've been reading Milestone on DC Infinite. Because I basically, you know, paying for the subscription for it, and I just want to see what my experience is like on the app. I just recently upgraded my iPad because I had a first generation iPad Pro, so I just got the like the current one that's out. And my reason for that was my first generation iPad Pro was getting slower when it came to Comicsology um, because of the amount of books I have it. When um, I was running this. It, it was working just fine, don't get me wrong, but there was a slowdown, and I'm like, I, I think I'm ready for an upgrade. So uh, I did. I took Apple had an offer where I could trade in my other one. I got like 600 bucks for it and, and put it towards you know getting a, a similar, because I've got a terabyte iZilla, as you call them. <laughs> and uh, with the new one, I just, I'm like, I'm going to really embrace starting to read more on DC Infinite just to see how I like the platform. So this, every time I've read it, I've read it multiple times now, I've always read it on the DC Infinite app. It really runs well. I love the guided view, um, which at nighttime I find the guided view helps me 
with reading more because I'll like before I go to bed at night, I've got one of these like lap pillows that like you can flip it and it's like it's a rest for an iPad or a tablet. And the nice part about it is um, if you flip it, it like controls how close the tablet is to you, depending on if you're laying down or if you're sitting up. Um, it, it allows like the perfect viewing angle, if that makes sense. And uh, I I really enjoy using guided view. I don't know why at nighttime in particular, like when the lights are off, I find that it's easier to read comics with the guided view on in that scenario. I've always been one, I had a, when I'm reading paper comics, I've got like this book light that goes around my neck with two lights on each end. It's kind of like a, it looks like it should be a necklace, but there's two lights you can snap both of them on. They're LEDs. It's, it's really a great way to read. This gives me that same kind of viewing experience with the digital that I get with the paper when I'm using that. And I love to read at night before I go to sleep. What's crazy is when I read something like this and I get excited about it, then I've got to read like three other books afterwards before that sleep part happens. <laughs> <laughs> and this was one of those books. I read this at night and my first read through experience, I'm like, that was terrific. Like, yeah. <laughs> wow, is this, this hardware is a really good book. I I ended up reading, like, this led me to read, like, four other comics afterwards. I just really, like, I kept going because it motivated, pumps you up, right? And then I'm like, well, this isn't helping me go to sleep at all. Yeah. <laughs> like, But I love that. I love when I get excited about comics. Talk about artwork. Uh, I really loved the art in this. We always talk about um, pencils, inks, and color work. We actually just talked about it in this. Very, very different. Very gritty in this presentation. It needs to be. And I really loved the shading and the tones of this. Um, it's it's something where I would love to see at what point in time the layers start to undertake this kind of feel. You know, if, if, or if it's in the inks, because uh, the pencils are terrific, the inks are terrific, the colors are terrific. I'd love to see the layers. You know, like what at what point in time does it start to get this feel? Because it really has a great feel. I love his costume. I there's something to really dig about that, and I think the presentation from the artwork was something that really stood out for me in this. Oh God, yeah, and again, it's funny because we both we both say this is a, it has a gritty book to it and gritty vibe to it. And it so fits that, but you go back to that opening page, Young yeah. Curtis. Yeah, that, there is no grit there, and again, perfect not to have that there. Right yep. there, you needed that beautiful crisp clean, clear artwork. And then as the book goes on, as he gets older, you start seeing it. And especially when he's in the uh, the hardware armor and he's fighting off, you know, the, the police and whatnot. You know, you've got that color tone and the you know, just that that that, that styling to it. But again, that that clean, you know, crisp look when there's focus on that wide eyed wonder of that kid. You know, when you, you know, and then, you know, you go down, you see his full face and you're like, well, then you see he's sitting there on his, his dad's shoulder, like, yeah, you know, right there hanging with, you know, doing with his, you know, with his dad doing the right thing. And it was like, man, that right there was a really cool opening salvo about who Curtis is, you know, and I think that was a neat thing to have to say in the show. And then you go right from there, flip the page to the horrific stuff that's happening. It was a beautiful blend of this wide eyed wonder kid to, okay, here's the horrors of reality. Here's modern day society. We've got problems. And I, I thought that was a really neat statement to have in within the action sequences in within this character development. They, again, beautiful blend of, character development and action, you know, merged together. It, this was absolutely wonderful in that way. Yeah, and it, that was something that really struck me too. And I think you're, you're nailing what I loved about this book because you're right, tone changed as it needed to. Because you even see organically as he's even thinking about the past, you've got like this, the, the color tone changes in the background, then it goes to this really violent sequence that it turns very gritty. And organically gritty. And it was something that was really important in this book was its ability to become what it needs to, depending on the story being told. My gosh, was the action in this beautiful. I This is an example of something where I don't know if I want to see this as a animated feature or live action movie, because 
you know, we were watching um, Fast, The Fate of the Furious, which is yeah. Fast and Furious number eight, because Mariah and I have been making our way through those movies to get caught up to the current one that's in the theater, finding that we're enjoying them. But I'm kind of into, like, summer blockbusters right now. You know, this summer we really kind of went back through and, and caught some ones that we'd missed in the past, because... We grew up with that, right? You know, a lot of, of those action movies that were these summer vehicles where, you know, they were just fun and explosive and all that kind of stuff. This lends itself to, like, I want this movie. Like, I want to see this. Because his shields and the whole action sequences that are in here just really were exciting. I loved the visual styling of this. Because of the action just popped. Uh, the idea that he has this different technology and hardware that, you know, he can keep evolving. It's not just that, like, he has these tools that, like, okay, we know he's got shields. I'm convinced that, like, next issue or the issue afterwards, we're going to see these shields again with some kind of variation on them. Like, he's going to keep evolving the tech in this suit. That's intriguing. It's like, what is he going to do next? It's got what I loved growing up about Iron Man, because I didn't read consistently Iron Man, but there were a lot of runs of Iron Man that I jumped on and um, were able to get, like, you know, an arc here or an arc there or something like that with Iron Man. As I got older, I followed Iron Man more and went back to catch, because there's been some great epic collections that uh, Marvel's released, that it's been nice to read some of the books that are landmark ones in Iron Man. This has that kind of vibe, and it's something I've always enjoyed when you've got these characters. Steel is another example of a character that I think you know keep, continues to evolve, but this is unique. It's really the kind of power set that he has, the kind of skills that he has. Uh, I, I'm convinced that over time we're going to keep seeing it. I like that it's not clean. Like, things go wrong in yeah. battle, and he has to, like, improvise find ways to combine his tech or utilize his tech even damaged so that he can survive. I, I liked that. I liked that things aren't, like, he's got this suit and he's fully protected. No, there are times where, in this issue, throughout, he was in some real heavy danger and, and had to think on the fly. And we got to see that he's a thinking hero. I loved that. I liked that the battle was not clean. <laughs> that part was something that I think is unique to the other armored heroes that I mentioned before. And I actually found it to be a lot more accessible because of it. Like, I was, I'm like, oh man, that's kind of cool that he was able to. Then, so then, instead of having it on his back, he was grabbing onto it and utilizing it that way. I'm like, this is really neat. Yeah. Well, and again, improvise, adapt, overcome. That's some of the best stuff that you get from heroes. And we saw that 100% from this guy. And, you know, you take him out of the armor, he's still going to be a formidable person. Oh, yeah. Just because of his intelligence, just because of his determination. You know, we're seeing true grit in this guy. You know, yes, with his armor, he's able to do some amazing stuff. But if he's out of the armor, he's not defined by the armor. Curtis himself is a hero. He is a force to be reckoned with. You put him in the armor, that's something even more. You know, and again, as you said, with improv, you know, because this story is starting off with him on the run. So he yes. doesn't have his big heavy um, you know, his, his main laboratory where he has all his toys. He destroys that thing. So what's gonna happen next? He's gonna have to improvise. He's not just the guy who was given armor and here, use this. He's the guy who built the armor. He knows 100% how it works, how it flows, how you can override this and improvise that, modify there, tweak it, you know, there. And that's the thing that I'm looking for the most in the next issue because he's got a damaged hardware. He doesn't have access to his main big, you know, lab. Maybe he's got a back, you know, a hidden lab somewhere. Maybe he doesn't. Maybe he's going to be improvising, scrounging here, this piece here, this piece there, you know, put it together and whatnot. I don't know what we're going to get out of it, but just this opening salvo, just this opening fight sequence, we've seen him, you know, throughout it multiple times have to, you know, improvise, shift on the fly. So I'm really looking forward to that. Plus, on top of it, we have this whole intrigue thing where he's been set up for being responsible for all this stuff. He's got to clear his name. So we've got a hero who's got to clear his name, plus, you know, you know, deal with the the this 
you know, military, paramilitary police force kind of thing hunting him down. He's got everybody else thinking he's the bad guy, so he's got to deal with that. He's got a lot of stuff going up against him, but he's got to keep pushing forward. And I'm so looking forward to seeing how he overcomes all these different obstacles, yeah. you know, and, you know, clears his name, gets things going, gets back on the path of being the hero. You know, it's there's a lot of stuff that's going to happen from this story that I'm really excited for. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, I, I like the idea with the lab that he recognizes when he's blowing it up that I'll just have to rebuild again. So he's already had to build a, one lab on the run. So that's something we're going to see regularly with him. The but this helicopter sequence where he was flying at it out of desperation. I, I got to clarify there and emphasize that out of desperation because I it's a lot of times you'll see heroes do stuff like that confidently um, because you know though I have confidence in my suit all those pieces that was a desperation move that like yeah. he didn't know if it was going to fully work or not but he, it was the only move that he had in that moment because he was they were bearing down on him. And it was the only way for him to get some breathing room. That sequence and the way it played out, I thought was terrific. It really involved, again, his, his adapting as it went forward, because that was an example of something that didn't end clean. And that's actually what happened with his jet pad, jet yeah. pack. And it was uh, just a really, really cool sequence of events. I like that he's created this AI that is representative of being kind of like his father, yeah, you know it's uh, it's his Alfred, so to speak, but it is representative of his father, and you get to see I think that moment early on, that sweet moment with his dad, where you get that that's somebody that he he has fond memories of, he looks up to, and at many times wonders if if his father had lived longer, what you know that relationship would have been like. I'm I'm interested to learn more about the foundational years with his dad, what he gained from dad. And it, it's, it was something that I liked that the AI was clearly him yearning for that person who was pivotal. I, I mentioned on the show many times that I was adopted, but I was adopted as an infant. So I don't, I, my, all of my memories, all of my emotional connections are to my adoptive parents because of the fact that I was adopted as an infant. They were my parents from day one straight. I mean, I came home the first day that I was born because you can do that as a baby. The mother has to stay in the hospital usually for time afterwards, but not the baby can go, you know, as long as everything's good, you're good to go. (laughs) So um, I don't have, nor will I ever have that because that's something he actually knew dad. This, This benefactor from Alva Industries Um, this became his father figure. He was able to kind of guide and mold this kid into into the potential that he saw paying off for him. It it wound up being, I'm sure, a great PR move for him, but also beyond that became a great opportunity to use that talent to help him achieve his goals. So I love that relationship where... You're dealing with a villain that has a very close personal connection to Curtis, and it's it's a different sort of relationship. Yeah, and again, that's a neat connection. That's a neat part of the story. Is as you as you're talking about just that relationship the hero and the villain have, and that for me is going to tell some really cool stories down the pipeline. Just because you know, again, some of the best Luther stories are Luther and Superman. You know, it's that. That ultimate connection, that ultimate rivalry where if those two could ever put aside their differences and actually work together, they could make the world a better place. Think about it. Just that it, the intelligence and the, you know, everything that is that makes Luther Luther, if he would actually embrace you know, Superman and embrace what Soup brings to the table, those two working together would be, it'd be amazing. Yep. Same thing right here. We've seen him create this armor. We've seen him do some amazing stuff with this guy. If he wasn't such a jerk, you know, and worked with him and actually accepted and, and didn't try to go the whole, you know, route that he's going, we could have some amazing stuff from society for these guys. But that's always that great classic 
problem with these here with these hero villain relationships, especially on the villain side. Um, you know, they're jerks, and or they've got that little flaw that makes them you know say, "Hey, it's okay to kill people." No, it's not. It's not okay. You should be trying to save society, not you know save yourself, advance yourself, and forget the rest of the world. It's. It, I love seeing this kind of stuff in comic books. I love seeing those moments where you're like, "I wish I could just reach in the comics, smack him in the head, say, dummy, you know, you're wrong in this situation. He's right. <laughs> right, right. Um, this this whole thing has been fantastic. Is the confrontation between the two of them at the end, where he's got this pulse where it's his way to be able to talk to him using this technology from a distance, but then he's weaponized it. And we see that he's evolving the tech. That's one of the things that I loved at the end. It's um, Edwin versus Curtis. And that I want to see the battle between the two of them. It's going to be something that's an interesting struggle. And I really, really enjoyed the way that that all played out. Because this is a great setup issue. You've got to take somebody like me who... I don't know this character at all. I Now, I, now like, I, from this issue... I know him enough that I'm in. I'm in. Curtis <laughs> Curtis rocks. I mean, woo. I re- this is like really a great I love Exo Man of War. I love the armored characters. When you're able to you look at Steel, you look at Iron Man, you look at Exo Man of War, you look at now this character. They're all unique. And it's it's proof that you can take concepts like this and, and make a new and interesting character. I love this. I really, really loved this book. It's Right now, it's my favorite of these three Milestone books, and I don't say that to diminish the other two. I say it to praise this one because I love the Milestone line. These three books that have come out right now, I like that they focused on these three titles. I like that the season aspect's here. Um, I can't wait to see where this goes, and I hope it's successful. I hope people are giving this a shot because um, these are really, really terrific titles. I'm glad we've gotten a chance to talk about all of them now. Um, I want to I think as the season continues, we'll have to pop back in and do a milestone catch up just yep. to see where we are. Because um, this, you and I both got really excited at, about this from Fandom last year. And to finally see this coming to fruition, finally have the opportunity to read this. I know the pandemic kind of delayed, I think it was the pandemic at least, delayed some of this. But the t- I, to me, it's, I think the timing of the release is perfect. I'm really enjoying these books, so I hope people are giving it a shot. There they are, all alone, except for that old character. I would like to remind everyone about our show voicemail line. It's 1-440-388-4434 or Dr. Norge on Skype. We love having you part of the show. RagingBullets at gmail.com is our email address. You prefer to contact us that way. We are proud to be part of an amazing Facebook group community, and we use that as our forum, and we're proud to be connected with it. It so f- goes so far beyond being a forum of our show, thanks to the wonderful people there that have made it their own home. And it's a place I go to find out news about comics and pop culture in general. So I want to thank everyone who posts over there. RagingBullets.com is our show website. You'll find news on the upcoming releases. You will find it feeds into Twitter and our Facebook fan page. The About Us section of our show website is where you're going to find out how to connect with us on all kinds of social media and gaming platforms. We love to connect with you in any capacity. Sponsoring us this episode is DCB Service at InStockTrades.com. Jim, what's going on over at DCBService.com? DCBS is not just a great place to get comics. They've got all types of uh, various geek apparel, toys, models, collectibles, various games, dice games, accessories for the different role-playing games. So please... Explore them, check them out, and thank you, DCBS. Over at InStockTrades.com, remind everyone to check out Batman Adventures Cat Got Your Tongue trade paperback. $9.99 regularly, 42% off, only $5.79. Batman Zero Year trade paperback, $29.99 regularly, 42% off, only $17.39. I want to thank DCB Service and InStockTrades.com, as always, for supporting our podcast. Our next episode, Jim, you and I are going to be back. We're going to be talking about Batman 89 and Superman 78. As these books are finally out, we will see you then. Bye. All right, you guys. Are you ready to sing your song? I'm sure we are. Yeah, let's sing it now. Okay, this should be fun. Now get ready for your cue. Okay, Sean? Okay. Okay, Jim? Jim? Jim!
Okay, fellas, get ready. That was very good, Sean. Naturally. Uh, Jim, you're a little flat there, so be careful. Jim? Jim? Jim! Excellent job, guys. Let's sing it again. Yeah, let's sing it again. No, 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 that's enough. Let's not push it. Push it? What is that? Yeah, what are you talking about? No, I don't. I didn't mean to buy that. 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 I didn't mean to bu